Good evening to everyone in the West, and good morning to our friends in Japan and the other side of the globe. I'm Alicia Ogawa, Project Director here at CJEB for the project on Japanese corporate governance and stewardship. This webinar is another in our series which aims to contrast best practices in ESG investing and corporate governance in Japan and in the U.S. We're truly fortunate to have two very influential investors speaking on these issues here tonight. The California State Teachers Retirement System, or CalSTRS, is the largest teacher's retirement fund in the world, with $319 billion under management. Verity Chagar, with us here tonight, leads the corporate and market accountability activities and manages this, the fund's net zero program. She's also co-vice chair of the SASB Standards Board, which as many in the audience will know, is responsible for the critical task of developing global standards for ESG reporting. Our second speaker, Ms. Miyuki Zania, is responsible for incorporating ESG approaches into the entire portfolio of Daiichi Life Insurance, which totals about 38 trillion yen. And she's also responsible for promoting global sustainability at Daiichi Life Holdings. Both of our speakers have loads and loads of other impressive achievements in their backgrounds, but I want to focus on their current responsibilities here tonight. I've recently been working with several non-Japanese investors to help structure their ESG conversations with Japanese companies. And I'm often struck by, on the one hand, how the foreign investor will occasionally be advocating values that make a lot of sense in the investor's home country, but which are not necessarily obvious or relevant in Japan. For example, Disclosure of corporate political contributions is a very hot topic in the U.S., but there's no true equivalent in Japan. On the other hand, I've heard the same investors argue that very basic expectations on key issues, such as board director independence or diversity, should be tailored to Japan's special characteristics, its business practices, and its history. Some large asset management funds with large ESG staff working around the globe work hard to adjust their agenda to the local environments. But others feel that on fundamental issues such as independent boards and diversity, Japan should be held to the exact same standards as the rest of the developed world. I hope our speakers will discuss this, but to me one thing is clear. Japan needs to do a much better job in communicating its own ESG agenda. For example, Japanese companies should want to disclose details about their earthquake preparedness efforts and about how they're contributing to managing the aging of the society. They can also do a far better job of explaining their energy transition in a realistic way. As an illustration, many Western investors I meet are unaware of the difficulty of using offshore wind power because Japan's oceans are too deep for conventional wind turbines. I'm keen to hear from our speakers tonight whether they share my view that Japanese companies in general are very good at disclosing heaps of numbers, but they're very bad at communicating a strategy around ESG. In other words, I don't find that many companies have defined for themselves what specific non-financial issues are material to their long-term survival, nor have they committed to sharing a plan for making progress on those issues with investors. I know that my two speakers have a lot to say about this. That's the reason why I've invited them to be with us tonight. Another element they have in common is their active involvement in various global groups of investors and asset owners, such as Climate Action 100 Plus, who are committed to speaking with one voice to companies on issues such as climate change. I'll be asking them about the power of these groups and the strategies they pursue. And on a related matter, divestment, which is selling shares in companies who seem to have no interest in improving their ESG policies, has become something of a controversy. Many pension funds have decided to sell their holdings in fossil fuels and indeed, the state legislature in California, where Ms. Chager's fund is based, is considering legislation to, acquire, to require California pension funds to divest their fossil fuel holdings. Others have questioned the wisdom and the impact of doing that, 
noting that these holdings are often bought by private investors who might do even a worse job of managing the transition to a lower carbon company. In the case of Mizenia, Daiichi Life has committed to cutting 30% of carbon emissions from its portfolio by 2020. One of her peers in a different company who has made a similar promise jokingly told me that the only way his company will be able to achieve that target is by divesting the shares of many companies. As there's a lot to discuss and two extremely capable people to discuss with, I hope the audience will have lots and lots of questions. Please put them in the Q&A box as you think of them. And now let's move on. I've asked each speaker to spend five to 10 minutes describing her fund and her role in the organization. And then we'll move to a conversation guided by questions I've prepared and by those from the audience. So Ms. Chager, may I ask you to start off? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be with you. I am a member of the California State Teachers Retirement System, or CalSTRS is our nickname. And we are a, a pension fund with assets of about 320 billion US dollars. So we are an asset owner. We provide retirement benefits to California's educators and teachers from primary school through post-secondary education. So they are the beneficiaries we serve and to whom we owe our fiduciary duty. Uh, because often they begin investing with us uh, at the beginning of their careers. That means also their uh, investment horizon is about 30 years or more given um, our obligation to, to meet those uh, payments for, for future teachers as well. So we have a very long-term time horizon in our investment activities. Uh, we are also um, a state, uh, a California state government agency partially funded by California state taxpayers. Um, and that means that we are also very much transparent in our activities. And we uh, are overseen by a teacher's retirement board who um, also hold public meetings uh, and our materials that we provide to them on, on our activities are, are also made public and open um, to the beneficiaries and, and a wider group of stakeholders, which um, brings sustainable investment and other questions about um, energy investment and engagement into the um, public discourse on a frequent basis. Uh, we have an internal staff of about 200 investment professionals and our staff manages a significant portion of assets internally. And our staff also selects asset managers and funds to allocate capital to. So we have a, a sort of internal and external management approach, a hybrid approach. Um, our portfolio is about half equities or stocks and we invest in global markets. Uh, we're indexed, so that means we're not uh, look, reading fundamental reports and um, company reports in order to select which companies we buy, but rather we intend to replicate the MSCI ACWI. And so that means uh, we are very long-term investors in these stocks and we own companies for as long as they're in the index, you know, generally 10 plus years. Um, and it also means our exposure to Japan and Japanese stocks is about 6% of our equities portfolio. So it's an important um, part of our own fund. The team I sit on, the Sustainable Investment and Stewardship Strategies team is a, is a team of about 20 people and we manage both public and private assets, um, which we consider uh, and, and uh, research to be sustainable. Um, we are also responsible for proxy voting and corporate engagement with portfolio companies on behalf of the total fund. And we coordinate the staff's activities to respond to the board's pledge uh, that we should achieve net zero emissions in the investment portfolio by 2050 or sooner. So that's an overview, and I hope we'll talk more about um, how that plays out in our day to day. Thank you very much for that introduction. May I ask uh, Zenia san to, um, to uh, uh, introduce herself now? Uh, thank you for inviting me today, and it's my very honor to join this webinar. And first of all, I would like to uh, introduce our company uh, using the slides. The Dutch Life Holdings is a Japanese insurance group, group and headquartered in Tokyo, listed in the Tokyo Stock Exchange and uh, listed in 2010. And from 2016, a company changed its organization to uh, style to holding to promote uh, global operations. Today, I would like to uh, make some comments as the head of 
Sustainable Finance at the Dutch Life Insurance, uh, which is a company of uh, offer life insurance to the individuals and corporate corporate companies in Japan. Okay, next next space, please. Yes, uh, this uh, I would like to use this slide to uh, explain our corporate strategy. Uh, we will celebrate our company's 120th anniversary this September. This slide shows how the Dutch Life Holdings uh, cons uh, consider sustainability and our materiality in the latest midterm business plan. As a life insurance group, which offers the promotion of the uncontrollable life events, we have offered the protection for our clients and for a long time. However, in the latest plan, we have set to protect and improve the well being of all people not only for our clients, but for all. Our new group vision beyond our insurance domain considering the SDGs. The Zeit Life Insurance is a core group company and we believe we, play, uh, we could play an important role as a long-term institutional investor for making the transition to the better life, better future in Japan. As a responsible investor, we promote more sustainable finance and we like to achieve a sustainable society over the next hundred years. Next, next page, please. I would like to explain how we have supported Japanese economy in the past years. You can find uh, our transition of our portfolio uh, since the World War II. After the World War II, almost everything in Japan was destroyed and we have to build up from the scratch. We have supported the new industries or emerging companies by holding their equities or offering corporate loans to them as a long-term financer. We also supported the Japanese government by purchasing continuously the government bonds on a regular basis. At the top column, you can see a basic for investment policy as a life insurance company. These are, uh, we have to keep profitability, safety, liquidity, and public nature. Long before the world ESG investment, we have made responsible investment in a similar way. So for us, the responsible investment is a, not a new one, but it's our long lasting behavior of investment. When we look back at our history, it is also the history of building the trust from the individual customers and corporate clients in Japan. And when we, uh, so when we do engagement with the corporate uh, customers, this uh, trust for us is a valuable source for engagement. Next space, please. This slide shows the Dutch life insurance asset portfolio as of the end of March last year. Uh, this is almost the same right now. Almost half of the assets are in bonds and about 10% in equities. Recently, we have increased a portion of alternative investment. The difference of the portfolio from the one of GPI is because we are a life insurance company. We play a role as a long-term insurance investor, and at the same time, we have to be resilient by managing our corporate risk as a life insurance company. That's the, re uh, the reason for the difference. You can find the uh, numbers of our engagement last fiscal, uh, last fiscal year. Every year, uh, we made our engagement a theme and selected the companies for dialogue. Among the investing companies, there are many companies that we have not a large shareholder. However, we think it is important to make engagement with the ex executive directors of the, or the board of directors. We evaluate all investors' company using various information regularly, and the dialogue with investing companies are the important source of for evaluating companies. And using this in-house evaluation, we are monitoring and sometimes change the amount for each individual company's investment. Next space, please. Uh, this slide shows our way of responsible investment. <clears throat> we think ESC integration is a a uh, fundamental uh, concept. Uh, and ESG themes investment is uh, for generating better future. Uh, engagement and uh, proxy voting is a kind of a set. When we make engagement with investing companies, we also explain our voting policy. 
Uh, next page, please. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, the whole picture of the approach for the responsible investment. We divide it into two parts. One is the ES investment and the other was uh, stress activities. Next page, please. Uh, this is a uh, slide shows a uh, basic policy on invest ES investment and engagement. <clears throat> we just released a latest responsible investment policy yesterday. However, the basic uh, concept is the same. A responsible invest is for the children of sustainability society in Japan. And if you promote responsible investment to resolve the social issues, as a result, we believe we could gain the returns at the same time for a long term. When we started stewardship activities in 2014, we found that many Japanese companies have little connection with the global institutional investors or do not have uh, enough staff members to take, off, take care of ESC matters on global changes. When we make dialogue with the companies, we have explained the company's ESG issues based on their maturity, offering the information data from the global institutional investors' point of view. So sometimes we have heard that the investing companies use the information materials we offered at the board meeting. And we all, uh, and I would like to explain. Uh, the reason why we have joined the global uh, initiatives at the first paying game. We see the changing the ESG field in the global basis are so rapid that sometimes we could not catch up the latest movements if we, not, we are not in the circle. That's one of the biggest reasons. And to join the global initiative is not only for our companies, but also for offering the information to the investment, investing companies. Next page, please. Uh, this slide shows which SDG area we are focused in investment. You can see we have increased our investment in climate change, climate risk related investment for better quality of, and also the better quality of life. And uh, we have read the report from the IPCC recently. And this year we would like to find more investment opportunities and also to promote uh, the investment for the, uh, for the uh, natural uh, capital and also the biodiversity losses. Thank you. And next, next page, please. Uh, this shows how we tackling the climate risk. We joined the Climate 100 in 19, uh, 2019 and the Next Zero Asset Owner Alliance in the first member in Japan and also in Asia last year. As a serving member of the G funds, we also uh, would like to tackle with climate risk together with other financial institutions and to promote carbon neutral, uh, carbon neutral society in Japan. Next page, please. <clears throat> this is the last page I explained. Uh, this slide shows the initiatives which have joined. We selected the in initiatives based on the company strategy. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions, both of you. Um, I'd like to lead off with a, a really open-ended question, but ask you to keep the answers kind of brief, which is, um, I often open these talks by saying, you know, in Japan, uh, we usually characterize Japan as a stakeholder-focused uh, form of capital capitalism with little attention paid to shareholders. And in America, you know, we characterize America as putting shareholders' interests above all else. Uh, how much truth do you find in these caricatures? And how is the balance changing? What is the impetus for change in each country? For example, I noticed that um, uh, Zeni-san's comments on ESG focused almost entirely on climate and less on the S of ESG. But um, perhaps I could ask you to talk to, to say a few words first, Ms. Verity. Sure. So I, I'd say um, there are a number of movements or trends that I think have been um, contributing to um, the prevalence of companies uh, looking to their own impacts on society and the environment. And some of those um, might be what you may have heard of as the impact investing movement or industry 
uh, as differentiated from ESG investing or sustainable investing for those who are really in the weeds like, like we are. Um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals has really focused on um, encouraging government organizations and then later did a business campaign to help companies really think about their own impacts toward systems. Um, and then there are lots of regional efforts such as Europe's green taxonomy and their own corporate sustainability disclosure directive that require companies registered there to use something like the global reporting initiative to talk about their own um, business activities and the impacts they have on the outside uh, of their business that the impact on society or environment. And as you said, in the US, I, I do think there is still a prevailing sort of fiduciary context, which drives a number of activities, in, including CalSTRS, I would argue. And, and I, I say that also noting that our board has directed us to take on this pledge and figure out a way to bring our own fund um, to, uh, to net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. So that's one example of this convergence where we see these issues, whether they're human capital issues, systemic issues, climate being one of them for sure, that is widely recognized and increasingly um, accounted for and, and documented, um, where this uh, long-term risk um, has more and more examples of, of real financial impact on businesses and other assets that we own in our portfolio. And so it's coming to bear that these sort of long-term issues are now present near-term issues and therefore relevant for financial accounting and um, the, the general uh, purpose reportings to investors. And thanks to uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures that has also been really brought into a framework that could be more consistently considered at the board level as well. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm so itching to throw a number of acronyms at you, Alicia, and I'm trying not to do that, but I think what's happening here is I'd call it a dynamic materiality context where things that people used to think of, of as decades away are increasingly becoming part of the near-term financial context. And so it behooves companies to really think long-term, to, to define and develop a strategy for the long-term and to continue to monitor the company's strategy and its effectiveness in the current market context where market tastes and supply chain issues and climate issues and, and weather and then consumer behavior is sort of constantly adapting and changing and, sh and reshaping the way business is done. We can all point to industries that never existed 20 years ago and many that have gone away. Um, and this is just a normal part of the economy. And I think we're getting better thanks to SASB and ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, we're getting better at really accounting for those and really putting them into a written context appropriate for investor consideration. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing you and Zanissa both talk about uh, your roles on SASB, but um, I would also add, I'm personally very interested in this new concept about portfolio management, which is, as you mentioned, you have to ha hold uh, all the companies in an index forever. And you cannot diversify the risk away of the market movements. And therefore, the only way to preserve the value is by attacking the systemic problems in the market, whether it's you know climate, you know, whether it's weather events or whether it's political instability or whatever it might be. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to Zenia-san now for her response about, you know, is Japan truly uh, a, a, share, a stakeholder only society? And is it changing? Why or why not? Uh, yes, um, basically, I think uh, the the companies uh, for a long time in Japan is a bank governance continues for a long time. Uh, of course, uh, still uh, continues, I think. But after the uh, corporate governance was settled in 2015, and also the, just before the year, uh, the Swiss Corp, uh, Japan Swiss stewardship court was settled in uh, 2014. The reason why the gov uh, Japanese government installed these co two courts is to revitalize uh, Japanese society using the, the power and the role of the insurance investors uh, for the companies uh, listed in Japan. So that's one of the, uh, the turnaround point to, uh, for the companies uh, to think about the uh, uh, shareholders, equity shareholders. So um, from compared to the, uh, the companies in the United States or the 
uh, Europe, uh, the, <laughs> think <laughs> the history of the to think about the shareholder is a little bit uh, short. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so yes, that, <laughs> that's one of the <laughs> reasons. Yeah. But uh, the mindset has changed so rapidly. <laughs> so we are keeping on to promote uh, to think about the shareholders much more yeah. than before. I think it is um, worth noting that it is a kind of different reason why this happened in Japan, which is Prime Minister Abe, I think, rightly understood that, you know, the only way to revitalize Japanese economy was to get all that cash off the company's balance sheet and make them take risks and make them pay people more and invest more and so on. And and in order to get them to do that, he needed the investors to kick them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, let me add, go on to the next question now. Um, both of you, in your jobs as responsible investors, you need to create a dialogue with the management of the companies that you invest in, and you need to encourage them to manage the business in the best interest of your beneficiaries. Now, one of you is working for a pension fund, and the other one is working for a public company. Um, what is the difference in this uh, context of being an asset owner and an asset manager for example, if you know most asset managers have to be responsive to their customers, you know for Verity, I you have different um, uh, entities that you're beholden to. So, what is the difference between being an asset manager and asset owner in this context of ESG? May I ask you, Verity, first? Certainly, and and um, you know I. I know Zinnia Sun will, will do it better at talking about the difference between an insurance company with a portfolio, which is a little bit different than another sort of fund manager, asset mm -hmm. manager. Um, but having spent a large part of my own career on the asset management side before uh, joining Calsters um, on the pension fund side, you know, I'd say for one thing that's matching up is the, the time horizons are, are often lining up actually a little bit better uh, between asset owners and asset managers especially where you're talking about index management, um, where you are trying to own the same companies for the same amount of time as they're in the index. So I think there's good alignment there. Um, also true in private markets where uh, the asset life of the investment is very long and there's good alignment um, and co-ownership there too. I'd say um, where there might be more differences comes up in the governance context um, and as you mentioned, the stakeholders, you know, asset owners have the luxury of having a single point of view. Um, we develop our own point of view, but the asset manager has to serve all its customers. And, and if it follows fiduciary duty, treat them all equally. And that's no small task when you have two or many clients directly in opposition in their own points of view. It's very difficult. Um, and it comes up and it, it comes up into play into tricky issues when you're deciding how to vote a proxy at a given company. Um, even when you have a corporate client um, who, who has a proxy for vote, how do you decide to vote that? Uh, can you differentiate your vote for that single client versus your other clients? There are a lot of hard questions and, and um, that's why I think ethics is, is paramount in a fiduciary context every individual um, employed at an asset manager and asset owner has to really be driven by strong business ethics um, and a fiduciary context. Yeah, I should have prefaced the question by noting that you've been on the other side, so you can, you've had both experiences. Um, Zenia san how would you answer that question? Yes, uh, the, the life, life insurance company is an asset owner, but uh, most of the, uh, our assets we manage by ourselves. So that we play as kind of the asset managers. And uh, the already I explained about, about our ESG investment policy. We ask, uh, even though uh, we ask the outside man asset managers, we ask them to use up in ESG policies. That's the reason. And also uh, the difference between the uh, beneficiaries, uh, maybe um, thinking about the education for the financial, and finance in Japan, it's a little bit laggard from that of uh, comparing the US. So uh, the, when we uh, started our strategic activities, we already uh, prepared to explain what we are doing, but it's the, uh, at the beginning, they don't uh, have much interest in our activities. But recently for, for maybe uh, seven years, so many 
uh, our customers are very keen about to read our activities, what we are doing on invest, ESC investing. That's, 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 encouraging. that's encouraging to hear. Um, so you both are investing in hundreds and hundreds of companies in the index. How do you choose which companies to engage with, to have meetings mm -hmm. with, and to develop a partnership with? And what is the best way that you communicate your views? For example, you know, if it is a direct meeting, do you meet with the CEO, with the independent board director, with a sustainability officer, with the IR officer? And if you're not getting the understanding of the company, at what point do you make your views public or make shareholder proposals or vote against management? Can I ask you that question first, Verity? Well, I guess several questions first, Verity. And, um, you know, this is a constant challenge. We, we have a, a, a team of 20 people, but really two people are, are responsible for executing most of our votes across thousands of stocks. And, and so, um, when, when we get a lot of requests, we really have to prioritize given um, our staff and it's, it's a constant challenge. Uh, it's one reason we've developed uh, what we call our stewardship priorities to really help focus our own activities and make sure that we're engaging with companies on those top themes that are of greatest import to our beneficiaries and to our board. Uh, those priority areas at Kelsters are corporate and market accountability, and that is engaging with some of the policy makers and sort of market infrastructure players, including standard setters. Path to net zero, of course, is really important to us. Board effectiveness overall um, includes a lot of important topics embedded, including audit integrity and human capital management for us at Kelster. So that's a really important area. And then finally, responsible firearms, which is an important but realistic difference between US reality and Japanese markets. Well, can I, can I stop you there? Because I, I've been thinking about this and I actually have been talking to a few people. So um, in fact, I was going to give you that example in my opening remarks. I spoke to a foreign, a, a Japanese person who works for a foreign asset man, management manager in Tokyo. And this person was saying, oh my God, my head office is asking about gun control. My head office is telling me to talk to Japanese companies about gun control. And as you just said, well, it's not an issue in Japan. But there are many Japanese companies that have substantial operations in America. And so should it be an issue that you talk to them about? Well, we've, we've taken a really sort of strategic approach to that issue where we've first um, collaborated with manufacturers um, and then worked on the retailers to really ensure that there are safe practices. And that's really a, a US market specific context. Um, and, and now um, because of the unfortunate reality of, of folks just um, wanting to skirt regulations and rules, um, there's now this phenomenon of, of folks buying components over the internet and then building their own firearms, which is a real problem. And so, We've taken um, a strategic approach to look at um, credit card facility payments to understand is that a, a, an area where we could really at scale help reduce that risk and that prevalence of, of danger to people in the US. Mm. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering your question explicitly, but I, I do think it's about operations in the US and that's why we focus on mostly US companies. I see, I see. Um, great. Um... I'm going to ask you a question which just came into the Q&A box, and it's mm -hmm. it's from a a, a very um, a very savvy lawyer who a woman who's on the boards of two Japanese companies, and she's incredibly direct, and she, she I love her, and she says um, that in her view, I'm going to make this more polite than the question actually is. In her view, Japanese pension um, funds have very few skilled and well trained people on board, and she says, what do you th think is necessary um, in order for Japanese pension funds to have those tools. So I guess what she's asking is what kind of background or training makes a good um, ESG steward at a public pension fund? What is necessary? What skills and training are key? For, for a corporate director, that is? No, for a pension fund, for a public okay. pension fund. Oh. Um... <laughs> Well, this is a this is a tough question, and um, it, you know, it 
Long story short, it's not up to me because a number of the positions are actually um, ex officio and, and come along with a with an elected role. Um, we I'd be happy to talk offline about all of the elements that make a good director, but of course. Um, I'm sorry, probably I confused you. She's asking what kind of training is necessary and uh, appropriate for somebody who's working in ESG at a public pension fund. Okay, so on staff, yes, thank you. Um, so we have um, all kinds of useful skills, and I'd say one one thing that's increasingly relevant is just investment skills. Um, that is to say that I think the way investing is done is very much shifted, and there's been a wonderful convergence of sustainability issues becoming material to investment decision, and vice versa, investment issues increasingly turning in and, and driving sustainability both at companies and across the investment landscape. Um, for example, we recently hired an energy analyst to join our team um, because we're focusing on engaging energy and other high emitting companies through our collaborative with Climate Action 100 plus, but also because we need to have the expertise to understand risk across our portfolio to this really uniquely positioned sector um, to really understand the dynamics that influence um, the long-term risk and long-term opportunity to companies in that sector in our uh, portfolio. So I guess I would say it helps to understand the sustainability landscape and how it's evolved, um, but it also really helps to um, be able to deploy a well-written corporate governance policy uh, and voting policy. Um, and so we have a wonderful mix of skills that really boil down to good investment acumen. Um, but I, I did wanna go back, Alicia, if it's not too terrible to go back to your original question about sort of how we engage and sort of the nuts and bolts of that a little bit. And how do you escalate if it needs to happen? And I, I hope my... Um, yes. Um, so we very low touch, but it's very wide scale, broad scale for us. And it's, um, it's, it's a way that we can communicate our expectations and, and wishes to corporate boards. Um, so we will often um, communicate through our vote um, and we'll also um, occasionally directly engage with companies when the uh, agenda overlaps with our own priorities and a company is in focus for us, often because of another collaborative engagement program we're driving. Um, and we'll often speak with investor relations and the corporate secretary. Uh, management members will join depending on the agenda. Um, you know, the human resource officer, or sustainability officer, increasingly meet with the board chair or the lead independent director. Um, and so when we escalate, when we find that we are reaching out to a company, probably through a letter and also through follow-up meetings, and if we feel that's not being effective, we may consider co-filing a shareholder resolution. We do that very selectively. Um, and two uh, examples were, were last year through the Climate Action 100 Plus uh, group. And then even more selectively, uh, we engage in what we call activist stewardship. And this is uh, what we call, um, this is what we did with Exxon last fall, where we collaborated with um, a manager, an asset manager uh, hedge fund who took a large, and, and we um, did a lot of um, legal uh, steps in order to communicate to shareholders to help um, elect different directors who we thought were more long-term strategy oriented. And we're very pleased that we saw success. And that's really an example of where we think uh, engagement really can make a difference. Um, yeah, it's um, interesting to me to see more cooperation between activists and pension funds. It's very interesting. But um, Zinnius, on how would you um, answer this question about how do you choose, and you own every single company in Japan, how do you choose which companies to engage with? Do you choose industries or specific companies? And uh, who do you meet with? And if you're not making any progress, you know, what's the next steps that you take? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, right now, the Dutch Life has 
almost half of the listed companies, about uh, 1,500 companies, uh, invested companies. And I prepared uh, how we uh, selected our targets and engagement uh, this year is, I would like to use my slide uh, on page 11, I think. Thank you, Emiko. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, every year we disclose a policy and how we select our engagement companies. And this is uh, this year uh, how we choose the companies. The first of all, uh, as I mentioned about uh, the, uh, we are focusing on the first uh, theme is uh, climate change. So uh, about uh, from the uh, 1500, we selected uh, 50 companies with high AG emissions in our portfolio, not for the uh, Japanese society, but from our portfolio. And then uh, we, uh, we talk with these companies, especially on the climate change, how to make the company to think about the transition of their business. This is very important to, this is uh, for the, uh, important for the investing companies, but also for the uh, whole portfolio. And, and also uh, we, uh, this is a kind of, uh, and also uh, we think about uh, uh, the governance is very important for, for, from, for the long-term investors. So we selected uh, management strategy and also the governance strategy. So, and then uh, we totally uh, selected 250 companies this year. And the next page, please. Uh, this is, uh, we cannot uh, explain the details of uh, the voting policy. So if you see the uh, voting policy, so you can see how we are uh, talking about our engage, uh, to, uh, we are make an engagement uh, based on the uh, voting policy. So uh, this year, uh, from last year, we're thinking about the ES issues is very important because the Japanese scope of governance was revised uh, last year. So we always thinking, uh, talking about the, their company's sustainability at the same time. And maybe, uh, I should explain why we think about like this is uh, uh, when we do selecting the, uh, the engagement companies, we always think about the whole uh, situation of the Japanese society. So it's not for our port not only for our portfolio. So the divestment is the last way of, uh, to solve the problem. So for us, uh, to change the whole, uh, uh, the change the Japanese society as a whole for the better future is a final goal. Because uh, our uh, individual client, the number of the individual clients is about 10 million people. So it's about one tenth of the whole Japanese populations. So we, I'm very surprised when I joined the Dutch Life. I found many my friends explained to me we are the custom, the custom of the Dutch Life. So we feel very keen about, we have to think about always to think about not only for our, uh, the customers, but also for the Japanese society. That's the way of our investment. So this is a total different from the uh, other Mm, as a managers, I think. So I know that you do occasionally vote against management, right? Um, which is, I think, in Japan, a, a quite a strong statement. So um, that's great. There are so many questions coming into the Q and A chat box, and um, I, I want to raise one um, to both of you, and you can tell me who wants to answer first. But Sarah Lubman, who has worked in Japan and on Japanese companies and Japanese issues for decades says, how is the concept of diversity as an ESG goal relevant in Japan? What counts as diverse? Uh, what kind of commitments do you look for uh, in terms of diversity in Japan? Um, is this a category that investors tend to ignore given Japanese demographics? And I want to ask Verity first because um, the first conversation I had with Verity I had the impression, please forgive me if I have the wrong impression, 
that you were in that camp that felt that when it came to very, very high level ESG goals, like climate or diversity, that Japan shouldn't be treated any differently from any other country. But maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. Could you respond to, to Sarah's question? Yes, happily, and, and you're exactly right, Alicia. It's, it's a, um, a shift in our own approach, and it's a, what we view as an escalation uh, this voting season, this 2022 voting season. In the past, we have made exceptions for the uh, Japanese market, uh, largely because independence was not at the level that we required. So we still believe that there needs to be an independent chair who was not an employee over the last five years, that the board should be at least two thirds independent directors, that there should be three main committees uh, nominating audit and compensation. And each of those committees should have at least three independent directors uh, on its committee. So that adds up to at least nine independent directors on any corporate board. And we have not seen that. Um, and that was the reason, uh, despite many years of, of supporting board diversity, um, and um, most measurable and most executable in terms of gender diversity, um, we, have, we have sort of let Japanese companies have a pass. This year, we changed that position. And so now in 2022, we are looking for companies in any market to have at least 30% women on their board, or we will vote against the nominating committee members when mm -hmm. they exist, when we can. Um, and we're also looking for every company in, in any market to have at least one woman on the board, or we will vote against all directors. And this becomes very painful when we're voting against independent directors on Japanese boards, whom we still want to see in place. Mm. But we came to this very difficult decision, uh, partly because um, when, and then when a director is, is um, especially an independent director is, is added to the board, we expect that director to have a voice to shift the culture and to influence the decision and the strategy. Um, and so we are taking that policy across and it is still women uh, that is our, that are our most broad escalation uh, this year. Although we're, we're much more inclusive of other types of diversity uh, when we're looking to US markets, certainly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zinnia san how do you respond to Sarah's question about should Japan be given, be judged on different standards when it comes to diversity? Yes, uh, <laughs> diversity, uh, when we talk about diversity in Japan, it's almost the uh, uh, same words to promote uh, gender diversity, mm -hmm. only for the women. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, a, uh, it's a very complex uh, issues and challenges for the uh, Japanese society. And, uh, but uh, we think the diversity for the board diversity is very important for the uh, to think about the uh, risk management for the change rapidly changing world. So the we think the diversity uh, board diversity is a kind of the uh, the protection and think of, uh, and also the sustainability for the company. Mm. So if they cannot uh, realize why the diversity is important for the companies, uh, we cannot. Uh, uh, see their <laughs> futures opportunity uh, for the company to find out uh, uh, for um, because uh, as you know the Jap most of the Japanese companies is in the uh, among the global supply chain and uh, even though they operate uh, the activities in Japan but uh, if you think of if you think about the recent uh, Ukraine's uh, incident, uh, uh, there is a huge impact for the whole Japanese society, not only the energy, but for on, on and also for the food mm. and mm. everything. So mm. in, in that, in, if I, we think about the in the, uh, supply chain's uh, impact, we have to think about uh, why we think about uh, the board diversity is important. Mm. Mm. So right now we don't have any um, requirement as a, a proxy voting, but we always talk about the importance of the diversity for every company. Mm, I see, I see. But at, at the same time, as you know, uh, there's a many as, uh, people says about there is not enough uh, number of the people uh, for the, uh, the board uh, as a women. Mm. So 
is of course I understand, but uh, for my personal opinion, that if you really try to find out the person, exact person for the boat, boat and there might be many, I think. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it's a, an excuse in many cases. Um, I want to move on to another topic, and uh, geez, we have so many great questions. Um, but uh, I want to give um, Verity a chance to talk about the issue that she's dealing with, which is um, in, send of, in, in terms of sending a strong management to company, a strong message to company management, um, divesting your shares is becoming a hot topic. Now, I understand that Calsters manages to an index, and therefore you can't divest, but um, you know, there's been many pension funds, New York City, Massachusetts State, Seattle, Los Angeles, San Fran, have all announced that they will sell all stocks they hold in fossil fuel companies. You know, my students at Columbia just think, yeah, sell it, sell it, you know, like that's we want to, we want to sell. But it's a much more complicated topic than that, right? Um, so I'd like to hear what you think about the vesting. Um, maybe you can refer to um, the role that you had as an investor in a fossil fuel company in uh, promoting change there because you were an investor. But uh, can you give us a few words on that? Yeah, I, th I think we, um, we have the position and our board has the position that even the most shareholder unfriendly companies can change because market contexts change as well. Um, so markets, expectations, policy, regulation, but also stakeholder and investor pressure really can lead to social and corporate change. Um, and if we had not been invested in Exxon, we would not have been able to really um, encourage other investors to vote to change leadership at the board to bring in three new directors who did want to prioritize climate and help the company create a strategy to um, transition uh, in, in the current climate. Um, so if we had not been invested, we would not have been able to take a um, supportive stance and really encourage that transition, which is now leading to corporate responses. Um, they're not there yet. It's gonna take more than one year, but it is a step in the right direction. And we think it's possible with many other companies that have yet to transition. Um, Ultimately, if, um, if we divest, then we're not making a real world impact. We talk a lot about this when we're trying to figure out how we're going to meet this pledge to create an, a net zero investment portfolio by 2050. Um, because you can um, make your portfolio look a lot lighter in emissions through shorts or other kinds of um, sort of financial engineering steps that make it look like it's um, short emissions um, or has lower emissions from one period to the next if um, there's a market rotation out of energy. But that's not really a, impacting the amount of greenhouse gases in the real world. Um, so we believe by, um, by engaging these companies for change, uh, we can facilitate an orderly transition which is also about making sure that we're meeting our return objectives for the fund and meeting our fiduciary obligation to both meet our near-term return objectives as well as the long-term risk mitigation objective that's combined part of our fiduciary duty. Um, and ultimately we think we can be part of transforming the financial system to do it as um, having skin in the game to make it change. Yeah, I mean, and the, the ob other obvious point, which is often made, is if you sell the shares, if Calster sells the shares of Exxon, who's going to buy them? And it could be somebody who's much less responsible than you are. Um, but I, I, th I, I like to touch on this topic because among students, it's a very, it's a very like, passionate response. Yes, so we don't want to hold fossil fuels or private prisons or what, what have you. Um, I want to talk to um, Zania san about um, two things. Um, there's been an explosion of shareholder activism in Japan, right? There's activists, you know, at the large scale, you know, such as the ones that are involved in Toshiba. And then, then there's like dozens of funds that are investing in small and mid cap companies and really working hard to working aggressively to promote change. <laughs> um, I think in the United States and in Europe, we've already seen the rise of ESG activism. 
right? Where, as Verdi mentioned, she would pair with somebody who's got an ESG agenda and by attracting both value investors, because the company's not run well, and ESG people who want to see the company do a better ESG uh, performance, then you get like more votes, right? So I think this is starting to come in Japan. We had two ESG related proposals last year, one from an activist, uh, and there'll probably be more. So one of the questions here from uh, a Mr. Stewart about Baker is activists have been maligned. They've been bad mouthed in Japan. Um, how do you view activists and their role in promoting ESG in Japan and where activists are just pursuing a different agenda, whether it's capital allocation or G issues, governance issues, does it make your life easier or harder? For example, <laughs> if you are really interested in talking about climate and this same company is having to deal with an activist on a merger plan, you know, does that interfere with your ability to do your job? How do you see activism in Japan and ESG activism and how does it change your life? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. Uh, the movement doesn't change my life at all. <laughs> but actually, uh, when I talk with the companies, uh, it's a bit good timing uh, to think uh, for them to think about uh, who is better for their companies, uh, who is a good or better <laughs> shareholder of their company. Mm. Because as I told you before, uh, there's a long, long uh, uh, history of the bank governance. So sometimes uh, some companies don't care about their shareholders at all. So that's one of the reasons why there's a lot of activists coming in Japan, I think. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> this is a good time. A lot of activists are Japanese, right? Oh yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> of that's course. I think uh, there's a many kinds of activists. So I cannot say as a one uh, a typical uh, style, but mm -hmm. I know many of them. <laughs> so, but uh, this is, for me, this is a, I think I asked the companies, it is a good uh, point to think about who should be your company's shareholder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they want to do their, uh, goal or to uh, to achieve their goals or the target who mm. would be the better shareholder for them mm, mm, mm. and also uh after the talking with the kind of the shareholders they realize a good news or informations especially for with the uh, esc activists mm, mm, because mm. Uh, uh for the climate change there's a lot of expert they they are uh they have the hired a lot of expertise of the climate risks so mm -hmm. for the companies i think it's a bit good uh chance to communicate and also to take knowledge about the climate risk mm -hmm. and also for the social matters of course uh, many japanese companies don't disclose, disclose their activities on the social issues but uh the how say the Mm, the concept for the request for the social matters has changing because of the a trend of the world circumstances. So uh, to talking with uh, that kind of ESC activist is a, a kind of the, uh, the catalyst to change their mind for mm. the board. So mm. I think I, I, I like to ask them to use that kind of activist for the better goal to achieve their company's goal. Well, I certainly hope they're listening to you, Zania san because <laughs> I, I think that uh, activists of all types have something uh, of, of value to, to, to have the company here. Um, this is really terrible. There's like 15 questions in the queue. Cecilia Zhang, you asked about 10. Each one of them was fabulous, but I couldn't <laughs> work them all into the discussion. So uh, if anybody, really wants to follow up, please email me. My, you'll find my address on the CGIP Wells website, and I'll reach out to the speakers and see if I can get you an answer. I apologize that our time has come to an end. It went very quickly. So I just want to um, hope that you will all join me in thanking our two excellent speakers for sharing their time and their views with us. Um, yeah, please do get in touch with me if you feel you would like me to pursue an answer to your question. I'm sorry we didn't get to so many of them. 
Um, and I'd like to take just one minute to uh, mention two other upcoming events in this series. On April 15, uh, I'll be hosting Seth Fisher, who's the founder of Oasis Capital. Many of you know uh, he's been one of the most prolific activists in Japan, and he's challenged Japanese companies on their treatment of minority share shareholders, on diversity, on independent boards, on capital allocation. Um, and on January 8th, um, I'm hosting a panel of very experienced board directors in Japan to talk about what makes an effective corporate board. So it only remains to thank our very generous corporate sponsors for their support, without which we couldn't run any of the various programs housed at CJEB, of which mine is only one. So thank you to the audience for giving us your time. I hope you found it interesting and instructional. And thank you again to our, our generous speakers for being with us tonight. Hope everyone has a good morning and a good evening. Thank you again.